it is I, your humble host, Bill Hatch, the third, coming to you live from the palatial home studios of Bald Spots Productions here in the beautiful city of Santa Ana, California. Joining me from a more than acceptable safe social distance is my father, Chaplain Bill Hatch. How you doing, Pop? Doing well. Good evening, my fellow Bible inquisitors. I hope you are all blessed on this Saturday evening. Yes, indeed. And Rudy will be joining us later as uh, as his uh, activities allow. <laughs> yeah, that's including having washed two dogs today. Yes, that is true. Giving the dogs the baths. Yep. Yeah, he bathed both of them, and uh, that's that's not easy. So, but uh, so uh, so we will do our Rudy news. Is it Rudy news on Saturday? Or Rudy minute on Saturday. Now I can't remember. We can never remember. No, we can't. <laughs> it's Rudy's time for sure, but yes. we don't remember if it's news or minute. Yes, I think it's the minute, but uh, for Saturday, I think so too. But uh, so we will dive right into the material that we have for the uh, the Bible material we have for this evening, um, which is a good one. Uh, we, of course, are continuing our journey through Dr. John Barnett's so-called 52 greatest chapters of the Bible. Bible, Bible, Bible. Last week, we had a bit of a surprise in that uh, we didn't think it was really one of the greatest chapters because, well, because it was incomplete as far as uh, as far as Christianity itself goes, certainly ranks among the greatest passages. But the crucifixion without the resurrection is like half a breath. And so, even though it probably would have taken us uh, two weeks to do chapters nineteen and twenty anyway, we uh, we decided to call it uh, half a chapter. There you go. <laughs> And, uh, and as as we look at it, I hope that you all might have an actual Bible sitting in front of yes. you. And I hope you have it opened up to chapter 20 of John. And you should notice that there's a whole lot more of the pages on the left than there is on the right. Okay? Oh, yeah. Now you also <laughs> have to think, chapters 19 and 20 together. This is the center point of importance in the entire Bible. Yeah. Chapter 20 is exciting because it is the most important point of the Bible. Without it, we would be totally lost. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus came and said he was going to uh, be crucified and rise again, and he did. Just like he said, totally takes Jesus and Christianity to a different level than all other other religious groups. Yep. They're way over there, <laughs> out of sight, because none of them say and prove themselves like our Holy Bible does. Right. But even though it's, what, what would you say, probably... 25% of the way through the Bible or 80% maybe? 75, 80%. I'm not looking at a physical Bible right now. Aha. Uh -huh. so. uh, but anyway, because that odd sizing of it, this is the center point of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I want, would like to remind everyone that whenever you are considering the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell the center point story. Right. And the Old Testament points towards the life of Christ. And literally from Acts through Revelation talks about how, well, no, through Jude, uh, talks about how the early church developed and how they viewed the life of Christ. So viewed the Gospels. And, and then Revelation, of course, will be the point saying, uh, it's coming, folks. And everybody better get on God's side or they're going to be on the losing terribly uh, disappointed, shall we yeah. say? Yeah. Another thing, another point I'd like to make about uh, Christianity versus the other religions of the world is that 
Christianity, in Christianity, it is God reaching down to us for the sal for the salvation act itself. Yeah. Whereas in all other religions, and I would challenge anyone to uh, to point one out that is different, man must reach up to God to whatever their or whatever their uh, their higher power happens to be. Um, yes. Power or powers or 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 what have you. Um, that it's on it's on humanity's uh, shoulders to do to do the to do what it takes to gain salvation to gain eternal life or or its equivalent. And mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, but in uh, in Christianity, God seeks us out. God calls us. God provides the means of salvation, and uh, um, and basically does all the heavy lifting. He told it ahead of time. Yep. And it was fulfilled just as the Old Testament prophesies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't just done by one person sitting down and writing the Bible out. Right. Uh, you know, how many different authors we have here. Mm -hmm. It's in the 40s uh, compared to like all the 66 books of the Bible. Yep. And to be able to say that. 40 men writing over a 3000 year time period of time 40 people if we uh if we uh, include yes, the possibility of hebrews being written in part at least by priscilla yes <laughs> <laughs> yes the producer will be very pleased with that but i agree fully we've done enough research that we truly believe that strong possibility uh, and no, I don't believe Esther or Ruth actually wrote their stories. No. But they're certainly about women, but not necessarily written by women. Right. But that's getting off the point. Right. Tonight we get to talk, start about another woman. Yes. And because, like I said, John 20 really is the best of the descriptors of the resurrection. It's not the only one. The resurrection made all four Gospels, as it should, because that really is the most important part of it, is they were all justified in following Jesus because of these points. But not everyone accepts and believes the resurrection. There are always going to be skeptics, right. and they will try to use... Uh, any old thing to argue against it. So I want to read something as we get started, Bill. Oh, sure. uh, skeptics claim these appearances are the product of hope in the church in the midst of grief, as if these are grief-induced events. You know, like it's people's imaginations and whatnot, but the claims about Jesus appearing to 500 at once stand against such notions of emotional suggestion, especially when Paul notes that many of these people are still alive. And he does that in, uh, oh heavens, sorry, I forget which letter it is. I didn't write that <laughs> note down. They're in the back uh, of the book. They're in the epistles, which is the letters. Right. Uh, but Paul claims that Jesus was seen by more than 500 Others try to say that was all imagination, uh, but the Bible gives us several references to physical items of Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary cling to him, as we'll see here in John. Right. Uh, he eats with the disciples. He eats, although it's a little vague in Luke 24, but it's still... The fact that Jesus sits down at table with the two men whom he had walked along the Emmaus Road with. And as soon as he broke the bread, they recognized him and he disappeared. Did he take a bite on his way? I don't know. But later on, uh, on Easter Sunday, which is, of course, the day we're talking about, uh, he will ask for some if they have anything there to eat. And he will eat some boiled fish. And in chapter 21, he is uh, 
at least providing breakfast for seven or so of the disciples. He's cooking. Uh, where he has, yeah, he's cooking. And I don't, I know Jesus is far better individual and competent than I, but if I'm fixing food for somebody else, you know, I'm going to have some of it. That's all there is to it. But seriously, there are people who are always going to be skeptical. But when you look at the clinging to Jesus, ah, Thomas the doubter in another the week afterwards will literally be told to feel the nail holes and the piercing in the side. Right. Uh, those are physical examples of what went on. Right. And it was really great that Paul could say, yeah, Jesus was seen by more than 500 people at one time, and many of them are still alive. Right. So they're they're nipping that that disbelief in the in the bud. In the bud, <laughs> you know, as they're as they're going through that. Yeah. And, and it's is... important for us now to have that same kind of belief that right. if we look at them in those ways, that Jesus re was resurrected bodily. Um, not yes. that it was some spiritual resurrection, not that right. he was only human or that his God side had departed or, or anything like that, that he was all there all in one. This was a lot of John's reason for writing his, uh, um, for writing his, uh, his gospel in the first place was yes. to, uh, was to denounce, um, refute. The claims of the uh, of the um... disbelievers. No, I was the, looking for a specific. Uh, the, Gnostics, the Gnostics, probably. The Gnostics. That's who I was looking for. Yeah, and uh, which is where we get uh, um, certain uh, certain other books like the uh, the Thomas uh, Gospel uh, and uh, um, and many other uh, books that uh, um, just simply are not believable. They, they have been today. made not believable also. There's really quite a bit of contention as to did honest and sincere people write books and messages about Jesus and did others get a hold of them and totally change them? Right. Yeah, uh, no, we don't. But we have plenty of examples that, of course, aren't on that level today. Uh, if you read it, a book and then go watch a movie about that book <laughs> it's usually you know 95 percent changed right uh because that's the way people work on other people's writings they shouldn't uh i wish they could be more true to the books but that includes books about and movies about jesus as well mm -hmm. uh but I think we can get into, unless Rudy's out now. Is, yeah, is Rudy's, back with, Rudy's back with us. Do you wanna, so Rudy, can we wanna, have your minute? Do you want to do it now or do you want to do it after we're done? Because we haven't really started. Okay. You ready for a minute, Rudy? Yes, I am. I like that you guys are talking about that. And you know what it is? I, my, I have a sister that's uh, quit being a Jehovah Witness, but yet she's still in her thoughts about that. She don't want to go to heaven. She wants to stay on earth. And I'm explaining to her, we all got to go to heaven and let the devil run the earth for a thousand years. And then after he's gone, God will put his beautiful, beautiful home in the middle of Israel. I wish I was a real estate man, but he would put his beautiful home right there and we will be on earth and I guess we'll be farming and stuff, but we're not going to be tired like we are now on earth because uh, you have to sweat to work and sweat to eat and sweat. So hopefully work is going to be nice. Like, oh, I don't mind going to work today and this and that. So what it is is some people still pick up on the old ways of their religion instead of pick up the Bible, the main Bible. God has the main Bible. The real right Bible. There. Huh? The real Bible. The real Bible. It says, holy Bible. <laughs> See, and people add, and people add, and people add. Like, they have these other things, our watchtower, light tower, all these things. God is the light. We don't need him on top of a tower. We know he's the light. So remember, please, 
if you have if you're getting into Christianity, you gotta get rid of your old thoughts of your old religion because they are not real. And the reason we are real and we are true because we read from the Bible and everything that I learned is in the little red writing, that means Jesus is talking. So when I see the red writing, I said, Oh, that's Jesus talking. So remember, follow Jesus. He is the word. And he is the light. I love y'all. Walk, 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 walk with the Lord. Amen to that. Yes, indeed. Walk with the Lord. Although, Rudy, I will let you know that you missed up a little bit on the point that it is Jesus who will reign on the earth for a thousand years. And then Satan will rise up for one last battle and he will get himself kicked all the way into the lake of fire. And... Uh, we don't want anybody to be joining him in that lake of, of eternal no, fire. No, we don't. Uh, um, so there. But uh, just to, to say, there are there are many good translations of the Bible. We use several of them here on the show. Um, I uh, I use uh, the NIV, the Young, uh, the New International Version, the Young Young's Literal Translation, the um, English Standard Version, and the Amplified. And occasionally others, as uh, as the need be. Um, Pop, what do you? Who do you use? Well, for this study, I am using the Christian Standard Bible, but it's the Baker Illustrated Study Bible that has the whole thing, and I like it not so much for the uh, translation on the scriptures, but for the commentaries that are underneath yep. it. Uh, um, because it's really giving me a lot of things at once. As far as so, is it oh, perfect? No. no. But <laughs> none of them are perfect. That's why we have many no. of them. Um, yeah, as far as uh, as far as study Bibles go, I use the MacArthur Study Bible, although I disagree with him on several points. Um, he's generally uh, pretty good about uh, we we agree on the major stuff, and uh, and he has some interesting insights into several things. Um, and then uh, I also on occasion read the pulpit commentary, which uh, is uh, is pretty old, but uh, but still reliable. And easily available on uh, Bible Hub. Oh, I That's also fantastic. use uh, I use Kindle and uh, and Bible Gateway and Bible Hub and U Version uh, to find uh, to find good versions of the Bible. Um, U Version is available as a phone app, so uh, it's uh, easy to carry with you. And uh, Bible okay. Gateway, I believe, also has a uh, has a phone app as well. So, uh, yeah. um, but uh, I don't, uh, I don't have that one. Well, I don't use it anyway. I don't know if I have it. <laughs> well, and the point is, is that many of those that Bill just named have those translations available and others. inside of them, and uh, that's really important. Oh yeah, I, that's really important for people to be able to get to the point that they understand what's being said. I've been in this business. Well, as a minister since 1976, so it's been a couple of years. I'm still learning things and still come up with questions that I need to cross-reference or at least ask the uh, program director about. And <laughs> she sets me straight when I don't have that right. Indeed. All right, shall we get into Chapter 20, Bill? We shall. All right. Pretty much going to do it verse by verse until you tell me we can't. Okay. But not necessarily, yeah, not just one single verse stop and talk. But we'll do a couple of okay, them well, that way, and then we'll talk. There so, was some. Uh, there was a couple things I wanted to point out uh, um, about the chapter on the whole. Um, okay. And this comes from this comes from MacArthur, but it, it created a question in my mind. Um, it says, he says, Jesus does not appear to unbelievers during this time, that it's all <clears throat> disciples and apostles and uh, um, and people who have already uh, already stated a belief. But then we have Thomas, who is doubting, who is incredulous, as one uh, as one uh, commentator uh, said. And I, I like that word. I, I like incredulous. Um but uh, um, and so we've got Thomas sitting there, not believing, but then he is he sees the risen Lord, and he is the first one indeed, and we'll see this soon 
um, to say my Lord and my God, declaring Jesus to be both Messiah and divine. Yes. And uh, uh, in his uh, in his post uh, post resurrection form. Um. So yeah, so so I, I found that a little uh, a little weird, but generally speaking, that's true. We don't see Jesus showing up in the middle of the temple, for instance, or or some great public mm -hmm. uh, display. The five hundred were all followers of Jesus, of uh, of various, shall we say, levels. You certainly may. Yeah. So. Uh, um, uh -huh. So yeah, so I, I found that an interesting comment. Um, and to add to your your arrows for that one, mm -hmm. Bill, uh, it is First Corinthians fifteen five to eight, ah. where Paul is talking about Jesus appearing to more than five hundred people at once. Okay, I don't think there were five hundred people uh, at that point in time who followed jesus to the point of absolute belief right okay uh not until the day of pentecost and that's after jesus ascends well, we have 120 but, there uh that's true and that's another good point uh for christians in ministry of uh, trying to convert the world to jesus and believe me praise the lord keep working at it no matter what but if Jesus saw 500 people at once and 10 days later after he ascended, only 120 of them were still in the upper room, do the math, folks. Yep. Jesus had 12 disciples and he definitely lost one. Yeah. And yes, it was predicted, but still prophesied. But still, it's the point that we who are not the Lord Jesus in our, unto ourselves we also have to be realistic that people are going to reject our presentation of Christ. Right. When that happens, we do not have to cry. We don't have to curse at them. We don't have to wish them or tell them they're going to hell. We move on to those who are willing to listen, and we pray that the Holy Spirit will do a little bit of that rear end booting even even those boot to the rear boot to the head um <laughs> no the rear <laughs> sorry it's an old an old comedy bit uh where they said boot to yes, the head okay. i know um but anyway um no i was gonna say uh there was a book called the sticky church that talked about the front door versus the back door of the church mm. that every almost everyone focuses on the front door let's bring more people in but most people forget about the back door of the church where people are slipping out yeah and even though sometimes you may get people to come into the church pretty easily and they may stay for a while at some point just about everybody has an opportunity to leave by the back door and we need to watch out for that. We can't just focus on the front door and bringing new people in. If we can't close, shut the back door, or at least part of the way, then we're never going to fill up the church to overflowing. And we may never be able to do that. Right. And we might but not anyway, it is... but it, it, we can't forget about the back door of the church where people might slip out. We have to we have to put some of our attention on keeping people in the church once they're there. All the time. And that includes the ones who have been in there for 50 years. Right. And we miss that a whole lot when it's like, yes, we're reaching to get more people to come into the church. And what's the real motive on that has to be looked at in every church situation. Sure. Usually you'll find a dollar sign behind it, and that should not be the reason, but it is a reason. Well, the, because there, are plenty the of, ministry... there are plenty of reasons other than the dollar sign that uh, that are not good reasons. Sure. We forget about the Great Commission, mm -hmm. Matthew 28, where it says, baptize and teach. Baptism first, teachings continuous. Right. 
and too often we miss that. Nope. So we, I won't disagree with you at all. Nope, nope. But if Jesus, if okay, Jesus what else was seen post uh, post resurrection by a total of five hundred people at once, and yet the back door was open wide enough to let three hundred and eighty of them out before Pentecost, then <laughs> that's kind of bad. But uh, it also says that uh, shows that it's not. It, it doesn't say anything against us for doing the same no. thing because it happens. It's just something it we need happen. to work on. And the point that all this all started off for me was the fact that those 500 may not have all been believers. That's true. That's true, too. Uh, although I think Paul did say it that way, five, appeared to more than 500 believers. So I'm going to have to research a little bit more on okay. that one. But not during the show. Because right. <laughs> we have this great chapter. Yeah. And uh, very important. See, I already mentioned about that, about John's purpose in writing. That, uh, that John yeah. was trying to uh, to show uh, a bodily, physical resurrection um, of Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God, both uh, both man and divine. Um, let's see. Yeah, and so uh, so that's why that's why he wrote what he wrote, and uh, and why he didn't write what he didn't write, <laughs> like the rolling of the stone away. We do not. John does not specifically say that the stone got rolled away, but he said that it was rolled away. It was already removed. It was already removed. Yeah, that was that was the importance when he wanted to start his part of the story. Right. Uh, but it also says on the first day of the week, and I'm yeah. not sure all the others say that. Um, but it's Sunday, and that's okay. Yeah, it's it's Mary's the only one. I Mary Magdalene is the only one who's listed. But if you look. Mm -hmm. At verse 2, because yep. uh, it says that she only looks and sees the stone rolled away. It doesn't say she looked in the, in, in the uh, tomb either right. or went in there. It doesn't say that. Uh, but she runs back to Simon Peter and to the other disciples, in particular Simon Peter and John, John the author. Right. Uh, and she says, they've taken the Lord out of the tombs, and we don't know where they put him. Right. The we is referencing all the other women who went with Mary to the tomb, uh, but it wasn't what John was trying to focus right. on. Now, for those who are interested, we have Mary in uh, Matthew lists Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less. Mark lists Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of John, James the Less, and Salome, who was the mother of James and John, the uh, th Sons of Thunder. That is what we firmly believe. That is what we firmly believe. And Luke, in verse in 20, Luke 24, 1, simply says, the women. However, if you keep reading, and you should, in verse 10, he lists Mary Magdalene, Joanna, who is the wife of Chusus, Herod's steward, sorry, I can't read my own writing, Mary and Mary, the mother of James the Less, and the others with them. So there are even more women, probably more women, but uh, um, but uh, it theoretically could have been some men there, uh, but it doesn't say. Um, yeah. Luke says the women, so I assume that all the people who went to the tomb at the first were women. Um, which I find interesting because it shows who, I, I believe it shows who was the bravest, or the boldest anyway, um, of the believers. Because the male disciples were all locked away in the upper room hiding. Some maybe in other locations hiding as well. Um, that, was, uh, that was suggested in some of the things. But it was the women who like, okay, let's go up. We've got stuff to do. And uh, we have to honor Jesus and, and take care of his body. Even though they didn't understand that his body wasn't going to be there. <laughs> um, right. And, uh, but nobody understood. None of the human beings understood that. But, uh, um, but yeah, and so we see that the women were the boldest in their, uh, in their love of Christ. Um, and, uh, um, and the most uh, desirous to do their, uh, their duty, if you will. 
Yes, and when you add their family duty, it's even more yes. uh, intriguing uh, the, that indeed we Salome might very well have been Mother Mary's family right. and certainly Jesus' family, and therefore it would be one of the ob obligations mm -hmm. that they have to take care of the remains of a family member when they die. I don't want to get too deep into no. that. I wanted to bring out the point why it's important to keep looking at all the scripture mm -hmm. references to the resurrection because, Bill, you did a great mm -hmm. job of pointing out how many women probably went to the tomb. But here in John, it's only Mary, and she says, we haven't found right. it. Oh, I did. Uh, there is something else that's important in verse 2. In okay. verse two, well, two other things. One is the word love, um, whom Jesus loved. This is different. Okay. This is not the high esteem that we see. The Greek word is not high, highly esteemed love like we see in other parts of John. This is a, pers a love of personal affection which is the same Greek word that was used when describing Jesus' love of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. So this is a, 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 different, uh, a different word altogether, which I thought was interesting. Okay. And, uh, um, and then there was another question that was asked, and I believe it was in the pulpit commentary. Um, let's see. Uh, is the word they. Who are they? Are they the Jewish, the Jews, the quote unquote, the Jews? Was it the high priests and his people? Are we talking about Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus? Who is they? Or whom is they? No, who is they? And don't leave out the point of the Roman and soldiers the Roman, who were Roman, supposed to be right? standing. Yeah, I have that written down, but I forgot to say it. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Uh, that, that that group of they is indeed in, in, uh, intra, intriguing mm -hmm. why John would, would word it this, that particular direction. Right. Uh, but I would imagine that Mary would think it would take more than one person to carry a body out. Right. And we'll have um, some, some stuff on that as we, uh, as we get a little further along. <laughs> okay. Um, some interesting things that I'll only try to relate on this uh, without going too specifically, but one of the authors was looking at how John is writing his gospel mm -hmm. and how he seems to intentionally differentiate between himself, the beloved disciple, and Peter. Mm -hmm and yet still giving Peter credit when the credit is due. Uh, it starts in verse 2, you know, that Simon Peter starts off and, and John the, or starts off talking about Simon Peter and then the one whom Jesus loved. And then it's Peter ran, but the beloved got there first. The beloved looked in the tomb but Peter went into the tomb. Uh, I don't want to say that it's a rivalry. It also talked about the fact that the beloved disciple is the one who got Peter inside uh, by the fire so he could, not so he could, but it's what transpired when Peter denied Jesus mm -hmm. three times. And the author was trying to bring something of focus into that I'm not sure it's that important, but it was relevant and worthy of at least highlighting to well, you. I would think that uh, we need to remember that uh, that Peter and uh, and John, before they became disciples, had been business partners and probably what you would call friends, and yeah. uh, um, you know, and and uh, and probably lived near each other and all of that kind of stuff. So uh, so something along akin to the relationship of best friends. So they were they were not competitors, but they may very well have been competitive. 
You yeah. know, like, oh, I caught more fish it's, than you did. Great, let's put them all together and split them up so we can each uh, get paid. Um, of course, along with Andrew and James. Yes, indeed. And, uh, the younger brothers. Two sets of brothers yeah. who uh, definitely had a fishing business that was not a small right. one. Right. So they weren't the poor fishermen we often uh, think they were. <laughs> no, they may not have been overly wealthy, right. but at least not until Jesus told them to cast their nets on the on the other side, and they got so many they almost <laughs> tore up their nets. Uh, but anyway, we have Peter and Jan John running to the tomb, and John looks. Jesus, uh, Peter goes in. But by the way, it says John believed before it says that Peter did. Right. Because it says Peter went away wondering. And so that's some of that little bit of, of difference. The off the writer. Mm -hmm. The writer was ch choosing to show those uh, efforts. Okay. They saw the clothes, linens lying there, but no body. Uh, the wrappings had been on his head. Mm -hmm was not lying with the linen cloths. Right. Folks, if you've ever heard of the Shroud of Turin... I was going to say something. <laughs> you want to take no, it no, over? No, no, go ahead. I, I've, I've spoken quite a bit this time around. <laughs> I like the the whole thing with the Shroud of Turin, but it Turin. is not Turin. It is not the wrappings of Jesus right. when he was in the tomb. It was. It is some amazing kind of artwork and i think that's fine i believe i mean i don't have any problem with people having different colored skin on jesus or his eyes shaped differently mm -hmm. uh it's the point that they are doing what their heartfelt point for christ is now if they worship them that's a different matter and that has happened really to the shroud which is only taken out and put on display once every seven years yeah, something like that something like that uh but i do not believe that it is part of the wrappings of jesus because that is all in one piece yep. and this one definitely says linens uh that were separate from the rest of the wrappings by themselves off to the side yeah. and i really don't see why joseph and nicodemus would have taken time to put 75 pounds of perfumes on him, wrapping him up, and then after wrapping his whole body from head to toe, taking extra cloth and putting it on the head separately. I just don't. Right. So that's my opinion. Is it going to hurt anybody that way? No, it's not. It, it may but, have just been some kind of tradition or, or something that, uh, yeah. you know, that we just don't have anymore. But uh, um, the point is, is not to worship, right? It. Not to worship it, or or the veil of Veronica, or anything like that. Uh, the veil of Veronica was the the cloth that Jesus wiped his face on on the Via Dolorosa, um, the dirt when he was carrying the cross to Gethsemane. But yes. uh, um, another uh, another point because uh, um, people try to say that Jesus's body was stolen. And that's what the, the the guards, the Roman guards were paid to say, is yeah. that whoever, if somebody had stolen the, bo the body, why did they unwrap it first? First off, it was dark in a, inside a hole in the wall, in a, in a cave. They were, it was dark outside and it was, a, and it was, a, they were in a cave. So it would have been difficult to unwrap it. It would have been sticky because of all the resins. The, the aloes and spices and, and what have you. Yep. And then on top of that, you'd have a big old stinky body to carry out, you know, with however many people it would have taken. That, that's a very good point, Bill. I never really gave it any thought about yeah. why would they unwrap this body right. what, uh, yeah. in order just to steal it. Yeah. So I'll have to add that to my, uh, my bot <laughs> package. It's, it's a very it's good... Uh, Legitimate thing. So, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. And then on top of that, to lay them neatly, because the linen wrappings were neatly lying there. That's what the, the meaning of, of it 
of the of the Greek is implying is that it was neat. It wasn't just in a shambles. You know, it hmm. wasn't like when Lazarus was raised from the dead and people had to strip him down. This was different. Yeah. So almost as though yeah, some, the... some commentators did, uh, the MacArthur in particular, did comment that it almost seems as though the cloth fell from him through his body. As though his body had become immaterial at some point. But that's, uh, that's the implication that uh, that he infers from it. But if they were neatly, I don't see that happening neatly. I would see that just falling down in a heap. No, no, no. Um, uh, not not from him standing up, from him while he's still lying down. Right. right. But they'd still be as though it all whole table, passed through the body neatly, to, uh, to to lay down on top of itself. But okay. Anyway. Imagine it a neat pile. <laughs> like somebody laid out. I would his imagine that we are at P with Peter and John yeah. and they have looked, but they go back home wondering, even though it says John believed, but they did not understand the scriptures right. that he must rise. Right. And John saying that even himself. He believed, but it was like, Yeah, I believe he's not here, but you know, is he risen? Maybe not in verse three, according or sorry, that's not verse three. Oh man, I jumped so bad on those. That's in nine. They did not understand uh, that particular part. No, I also don't now, understand verse ten. Okay. Then the disciples went back again to their own homes. Weren't their homes up uh, up in uh, up in Galilee? Yes, uh, and that's again different translations. Okay. Mine says uh, that they returned to the place where they were staying. That was the upper room, I believe. The literal saying is saying. Okay, and Young's literal, so it's, as difficult as it is to understand it, the disciples therefore went away again unto their own friends. And that would have been the other disciples staying in the upper room. Yes. And I would say we have enough scripture reference from all of the Gospels mm -hmm. that would say that that's what was going on. The, uh, the NIV says, then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Yeah, that's what the Christian okay. says. So I want to believe that that's, that that's where they went. Better set for the upper <laughs> room than it is on the Probably. other Although it's possible that they were they, staying in different places to keep people from being, you know, if everybody's all in one place, that makes it easy to find everybody and arrest them all at once. So they may have been, also, it's completely different to have 120 people sitting in a room as opposed to 120 people lying down trying to sleep in a room. <laughs> it would have been a very large room. One way or the other. For that time of history. Yeah. Um, but it's there. And I personally believe, uh, but it, that'll take it off the right, point. Right. I don't yeah, want to take it off the too point. Far. But I won't go there. What I do want to go there is that John's account has them going back in disbelief. But guess what? Mary's still at the tomb. I have that Mary returned. Because remember, she went I to go been... and tell. Well, remember, she went to go and tell the disciples what happened, what she yes, saw. Yes, and so she would have had to have returned when... at some point to be at the tomb. And those two, she probably followed Peter and John. Probably. She might not have been because running. it basically says that they left, but Mary stood outside the tomb. Right. So I think she went back with them. Yeah. I tell you, she was the marathon girl that day. Okay. That's all there is to it. Uh, because she's gone and now she's back. Yes, the complete Jewish agrees also that they went to their homes. But again, that doesn't make sense because the travel distance is not possible. Right. So we have to say, well, they really meant their home was where their heart was. <laughs> it was in the upper room. Right. But Mary's standing outside and she's 
true, but they couldn't possibly go to their homes by the Sea of Galilee and back to Jerusalem on the same day. It's too far. Sorry, yep. that was a question from the producer. Uh, she's crying outside the tomb and she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels. Right. Two angels is a reference, I think, also in Mark. Uh, let's see, I have it written uh, down. So we have that. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Matthew and Mark have only one angel. Luke has two. Luke has two. Okay. Remember, we're only supposed to be doing this chapter tonight, but you can't. <laughs> right. You have to be able to combine. This is too big of a thing. Uh, Yes, but anyway, so two angels. Uh, she saw John, and I believe she saw John and Peter walk in to the tomb and back out of the tomb, and they didn't say anything about angels. I don't believe there's a back door to the to the to the tomb. <laughs> nope. They magically appear, and she just accepts it that miraculously way. Miraculously appear. Miraculously, thank you. <laughs> And she talks to them like they're regular people. Uh, and, you know, because they talk to her that way. Woman, why are you crying? And she tells them the story. And uh, it, according to John, but not in the other Gospels, she turns to walk away from those angels. In the other Gospels, it's, it's different. Uh, renderings of why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's risen. So you can put those points together. Instead, we have John's communicating what Mary told him. Uh, and she starts having this conversation with the supposed gardener. <laughs> and she's still looking to finish the morbid task that she feels she needs to do with the body of Jesus. Taking care of it and wrapping it up and putting it in a tomb forever. And of course it's Jesus, not the gardener. And Jesus finally just speaks her name and it is all over the place. She's just for joy. It's teacher Rabboni is the way it shows up in almost all translations. In the Hebrew. But it means teacher. Uh-huh. And she clings to him, which again shows the physical point of Jesus. He says, don't cling to me. Clinging to me in pictures is not a proper understanding of clinging, according to the writers that I've been looking at here. Uh, the commentaries but he says don't cling to me I still have to go to the father mm -hmm. and it's the fact that don't cling to my physical presence yeah. is truly what is being said here now the young's literally because Jesus knows he's not going to stay right. he's going to be ascending in 40 days um, yes now the young's literal in verse 17 says be not touching me as it, okay. It, you know, and, and uh, I didn't like the implication that much that it's like don't don't touch me, kind of a thing, as opposed to the do not cling or do not hold on to me, of the other uh, of the other translations. Yeah. He had many other things to do that day, and it's rather intriguing when he says that I have not yet ascended to the Father. Right. Because in Ephesians chapter 4, as we discussed last Wednesday, uh, Jesus took, led a host of captives free up to heaven when he ascended. And I believe that Jesus has already ascended and taken those folks. It was during the time that he had to go down to hell or to Shoal right. or to paradise, whichever ways you want to do it but he was leading all the folks who had been patiently waiting to get to heaven. And I think he's done that, but I think Jesus is also referring to the fact that he gets to go up and down even during the 40 days. He can be with God in heaven and he can come back down 
but the body is still here during this time frame. And well, it's the fact that Mary's supposed to take a message back to the disciples. Uh, and it's different than some of the other ones that we have in the other gospels. Here it is in verse, um, sorry, 17b, really, it says, uh, go to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And nothing in John about the disciples going to Galilee, right. which is what we have in other of the Gospels. It is simply that go and tell them again that you've seen it and it's happened uh, and that he will be ascending to his father and their father trying, not trying, but flat out saying, we are brothers and sisters mm -hmm. because you believe in me. Right. I was and certainly important to all of us today. I was going to make the point that this is the first time that he refers to the disciples as his brothers. And I couldn't find anything if this was a if this was a non uh, non gender specific word for brothers like brethren, where it uh, mm. where it means brothers and sisters um, or not. I, I didn't uh, I honestly didn't think to look. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, in uh, before this, Jesus refers to them as servants, and he refers to them as friends. But this is the first time he refers to them as my brothers. And this is because we've all graduated from friends to brothers. Thanks yeah. to the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection. And the resurrection, yes, sir. And anyway, we have the point in verse 18, 19 and 18, mm -hmm. that Mary went to the disciples and told them again. And that's where the thought stops. And then it picks up again on Easter evening. All right, Bill, you want to read some of that? I'm not sure how we're doing. We're we're gonna we're gonna go over time. That's yeah. That's thank you, dear. Uh, before this point of uh, the scriptures. So Matthew talks about brethren also, but it's part of the same time frame. Um, why don't you pick up a little bit here, Bill, sure. at 19. So when it was evening on that same day, the first day of the week, though the disciples were meeting behind barred doors for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace to you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with great joy. Uh, how far do you want me to go? Yeah, go ahead through uh, 23. Okay. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you as my representatives. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven because of their faith. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained and remain unforgiven because of their unbelief. Okay. Another, uh, another intriguing uh, point in the scripture. Mm -hmm. And that is the point that the ten disciples received the Holy Spirit more than once or was this simply a promise of the holy spirit to come well we know that peter received it a third time so okay i want to believe it's the giving of the spirit uh but it should also be looked at in relationship to genesis chapter 2 okay when God created Adam and formed him out of the dust of the ground, mm -hmm. and he breathed into him, right. giving him life. the breath of life. Right. 
And I believe that this is Jesus showing again that it's the breath of God. He is God being breathed into okay. these disciples. How many disciples were there? Well, 10, we think. Judas, of course, was already, uh, sorry, dead and gone. But Thomas was not there that right. night. But I think we have good reference that at least 10 people, disciples, received the Holy Spirit there. And it's really important that it's because it's not mentioned in Acts chapter 2 that the disciples had the power of forgiving people their sins in the name of Jesus. Yes, that is taken to an extreme now, and I don't like it. Uh, only Jesus can forgive sins. I do not believe the Catholic priest can. I do not believe Protestant priests can. Uh, I believe it all has to be the work of God and Jesus. But we have that reference here. Uh, and I, it was important to John, so it should be important to us. Right. You have any boxes on that? Uh, no, just other boxes. No, I've, I think that's everything I've got written down. Let's see: Acts versus Pentecost, uh, versus Acts and Pentecost. Was this a promise? Um, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Verse twenty-four. Have we gotten to 24 yet? No, we have not. No. So, okay. <laughs> All right. Shall I read sure. it? Sure. And then since it's on 24, I guess I'll stop. No, I'll do 25 too. Uh, but Thomas called the twin. One of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the marks of the nails in his hands, put my fingers into the marks on the nails. I put my hand into his side. I will never believe. I want to pause there because you said you had something on 20. Yes, a question. Oh, wow. Well. well, who is he the twin of? <laughs> I mean, really, uh -huh. who, was that the, who was he the twin of? Um, why would he be called Didymus? Which means the Because twin. he had a brother who was known to the group, I guess. Well, why would that but brother never be named? Because he never joined the group. I don't know. Yeah. So that's a good question. I often wonder if maybe it's because he looked similar to, uh, to somebody else in the group, uh, perhaps even to Jesus. And it could also be that twins were very rare back then. Could be. But we don't know. Uh, but here we have Thomas, and actually, he doesn't deserve to be remembered just for this. Right. Because there are so many other good references, thanks to the Gospel of John. Yep. Remember, you want to know about disciples and examples, you read the Gospel of John. Absolutely. And... Uh, but it's a week later, and they're still locked up together in the upper room, and Jesus still can appear through locked doors. Yep. So don't think you can lock Jesus out of anything of yours, because you can't. And uh, Jesus challenges Thomas with the words Thomas had spoken sometime after Jesus' last appearance. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any records of Jesus coming down and taking notes. Oh, really? What did Thomas think and say? Right. We Jesus already knew it. And so Jesus challenges him. Go ahead. Put your fingers in the nail holes and put your hand in my pierced side. And Thomas it does say he did that. Nope. Does not say it. What it does say is that Thomas declared Jesus as his Lord and his God, and nobody else has done that in Scripture up to this the, point. The closest we've got is is Peter saying, uh, is Peter declaring him to be the Messiah. You are the Christ, you are the, Christ. the Son of the living God. 
but this one gets him up to the full level. And, uh, but it's important to us because Jesus goes on to say, blessed are you because you have seen, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, that is us. Yeah. We have not seen, we only believe through faith. Absolutely. And it's the faith that we receive from scriptures as well as from other believers. But no one can show us Jesus. It is a matter of faith that says, I can go forward in life because I do believe. All right. I don't know how we are on oh, time. We're, we're going over tonight. That's for sure. Yeah, well, I'm sure of that. But, uh huh. Uh, sorry, producer. It's 10 after 9. We've just okay. crossed the hour mark. We just did because we started late. Yep. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's the first ending for the Gospel of John, yes. but not the last. Yeah, uh, people often wonder about this. There are, there are kind of a couple of possibilities. One is that, ver is that chapter 21 was not written by John. That is one thought. That is one thought. However, it does still sound like John. Very much so. Another possibility is that John thought he was wrapping it up here. But much like Paul does in some of his books, in some of his letters, may have realized that he had more par more parchment left over. And so he's like, oh, well, let's do some more. And uh, and may have gone back to complete the work. Perhaps. And it also might have been what I was referencing earlier, people not believing it was a bodily resurrection of Jesus right. because of Jesus with fish. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the need to let every Christian believer know that if we happen to slide the wrong way, that Jesus will still give us an opportunity to get back on the right track, because that's what he did with Peter. Right. Peter denied Jesus three times, and he has to affirm him three times in chapter 21. But we don't want to go there now. That's nope, a whole nope, different that's topic. A whole different topic. We do want. But I do want to, want to say it. that. Oh, absolutely, the whole Bible, yeah. but certainly that one too. That John chapter twenty, along with nineteen, is the center point of the Bible. Right. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, because he claimed to be the Son of God, and he was found guilty. And he was crucified and he rose again and really proved it is the center point of Christian faith. So it is absolutely important chapter and combined with 19, it is the, greatest the whole focus point. <laughs> yep. And so it is. Yep. And so indeed it is. Yes, without uh, without what happens in 19 and 20, the rest of it really doesn't matter. Um, yeah, um, now I still say that the one thing, the one verse we can't do without is, uh, is three, John 3, 16. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, but these things had to happen in order for us to have salvation. Had to happen. Amen. Sorry, I keep hearing myself saying Tud instead of two, and it's disturbing. <laughs> All right. But gentle inquisitor, if you have come this far with us, perhaps you will come a little bit further and join us in this family we call Christianity. We don't do this with sacrifice, for that has already been done, taken care of, and complete in the, uh, in the resurrection. We don't use magical spells or mystical ceremonies, because that's just not how we roll. We use miracles 
but it doesn't take a miracle. Well, I guess it does kind of take a kind of miracle for us to uh, to come to Christ, because God has to call us, and we have to respond to that call. And uh, but we do this with uh, with a few simple words that uh, are based on biblical principles, in order to align our hearts with that of the Lord's. And uh, so I invite you to do this together with us. Because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I call on all of our listeners and viewers to uh, to join us in saying the sinner's prayer. Because we all need to be realigned from time to time. Some of us daily, some of us more frequently than that. And uh, thankfully, uh, God is faithful and just to, uh, to forgive us. And... Uh, um, yeah, of our sins, our sins, and uh, so I invite you to say uh, the sinner's prayer together with us as we do it now. Dear Lord, dear Lord, dear Lord, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. I am a Cleanse sinner. Cleanse me of my wickedness. Cleanse me of my wickedness. Show me how to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Show me how to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And teach me how to love my neighbor as myself. Teach me how to love my neighbor as myself. Guide my steps along the path you would have me take. Guide my steps along the path you would have me and take. And help me to do the work you would have me do for the building of your kingdom. And help me to continue to do the work you would have me do for your kingdom. Come into my heart and be the Lord and Savior of my life. Remain in my heart and be my Lord and Savior. All these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And thus begins the journey. This is just the first step on the journey of a thousand, uh, thousand miles, if you will. And uh, um, the first thing to do would be to, let's see, today's Saturday, isn't it? All day long. So the first thing to do would be to find a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church near you and go and fellowship with some believers in the morning. Be Amen. Because, uh, yeah, because that's the way to do it. And then uh, from there, find uh, resources to help you grow and uh, projects for you to do and ways for you to show the world that you are a disciple of Jesus. And uh, perhaps if uh, if you uh, have never before said the sinner's prayer, that might uh, begin by getting baptized and uh, um, and go from there. But uh, um, but yeah, this is not the only program we have over the course of the week for your listening or viewing enjoyment. <clears throat> In fact, on Tuesday evening, we will have for you uh, YWL Online's Totally Approachable Bible Study for All where we will be continuing our journey through the book of Psalms. Uh, oh, darn it. I lost my place on <laughs> Psalm. Where did we, where did we went? 29. 29? 29 is where we will start. We will start on, on Psalm 29 and uh, we'll probably do about five, uh, between five and 10. Let's, uh, let's say that. Um, and uh, yeah, I do remember now you are, I concur with you. You are correct, sir, and uh, and all those things. I remember because twenty. It happened that twenty eight was at the bottom of my uh, page of notes for last time, and uh, and so we're starting at twenty nine at the top of the page, which I thought was uh, was funny. It's good to hear the son say the father was yes, right. Yes, I was uh, I was lost. Uh, <laughs> But uh, um, go ahead and read those verses, those chapters, or not chapters, those psalms um, uh, ahead of time so that you can participate in the discussion and, uh, um, and, uh, and understand what's going on. And then on Thursday evening will be uh, another show on another channel, uh, not quite after midnight, we'll be there. Uh, and I will be in, well, I will be having my discussion with, hold on a second, Stacy Chalemi and Justin Williams. Um, this will be an interesting one. Um, wait a minute. Where are we? <laughs> uh, Stacy 
is uh, um, has done many things, but uh, um, but is uh, is a is a speaker who uh, who is uh, involved heavily in the epilepsy uh, community. And uh, um, and Justin uh, has started a uh, an organization to uh, to help get people off the streets to help with homelessness. So, uh, so we should have an interesting conversation here this coming week that uh, hopefully will be uplifting. And uh, then uh, mm -hmm. a week from tonight, we will be having another episode of YWL Online's Anything Can Happen Saturday. And we'll be hitting up Acts Chapter 2, The Birth of the Church at Pentecost. And uh, uh, this should be a good one. We'll probably reference uh, some of the conversation from tonight, but uh, um, but definitely a uh, a good one. The birth of the church was an important event, and uh, certainly inspirational. Um, and then uh, the cycle shall continue okay. once again. But uh, um, let's see. Other than that, I think we are done for the evening. Do you find gentlemen have anything to say to the nice people? Yes. Please love God, not because you can get punished or nothing, because he loves you. And you know what? He does exist. I love you all. Walk a walk a walk with the Lord. And God's blessing from Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Indeed. God's blessings and a good night from Santa Ana, California. Be safe out there. Remember to wash your hands and stay tuned for the credits. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this has been a presentation of Bald Spot Productions. I'd like to thank our producer, Eileen Hatch, my mother. And, uh, of course, I am your humble host, as always. I'd like to thank my co-host, Chaplain Bill Hatch, my dear father, and my Ed McMahon, Rudy Corlew. Yeah. <laughs> if you feel so led, please support the show on Patreon at Bald Spots Pro. That's Bald Spots Productions. You can also find that on on, on Facebook. Uh, don't miss Not Quite After Midnight. Uh, you can also find that on Facebook. Here on Facebook. Um, please like, comment, and share to stay informed and kick that algorithm into gear, whether that be here on Facebook or on the other platforms where we are. Uh, we are on all the major uh podcasting platforms so uh, certainly hope you uh, like comment and share us there as well so thanks again and good night <laughs>